Thank you, Rep. Noor. It is now time for the portion of the program produced by our underwriters, the National Association of Home Builders. Please welcome to the stage Greg Ugaldi, Chairman of the National Association of Home Builders. Joining Greg on stage is Deborah Meyerson, Principal of Meyerson Planning and Development Consulting. Deborah and Greg, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. So I'm Greg Ugaldi, Chairman of the National Association of Home Builders, and we've teamed up with The Hill to bring this series of town halls to discuss and address housing affordability issues around the country. So I'd like to give special thanks to The Hill for working with us in our NAHB team for pulling this together in quite the audience. Thank you all, government officials, for working with us today, those here, those watching around the country, and listening to all these thoughts, ideas, and hopefully how we're going to address the issues down the road. We have a tremendous amount of stakeholders that have interest in this. Home builders, developers, and remodelers around the country, those in the rental space, and we have a lot of things that are adding to the cost of homes over time, and we're going to talk about those a little bit today. So I have Deborah Meyerson, who is the author and researcher of a book called How Did They Do It? It's a comprehensive review of different strategies that have worked around the country and some of the things that she's learned. So I'll turn it to Deborah and ask her, so what are some of the things that you've seen that are trending and really working and helping us out in these issues? Well, Greg, some of the issues that we see that we've heard about from Minneapolis today are really not unique um, to the Twin Cities. It's really something that we see across the country. Um, one of the issues is housing supply, which is really low in many markets compared to demand. And that, of course, is escalating housing prices. Um, and so in response to that, we're seeing more of a push towards uh, diversity of housing types, so missing middle housing has been a popular uh, topic to get to housing types that are not high density multifamily and not purely detached single family, but looking at duplexes, triplexes, accessory dwelling units, uh, attached row houses, all a mix of housing that we really need to be able to uh, address the variety of demographic and affordability needs that are at stake right now. Interesting. And, you know, a lot of those addressing density and things like that, right? So if we could control the land portion of a price, that helps drive costs down, as well as gives us more on the supply side. Absolutely. And so there's different ways to do that. Um, for example, uh, at, at Daybreak, which is a master plan community in, in the uh, South Jordan, Utah, it's a, a huge development, but one that they really sought to get that mix of hack types in there uh, so that it's really addressing the different needs that exist. But other needs are part of that, of really bringing in where local government comes in. Uh, local governments have their responsibility to help make it possible to add to that housing supply, and that starts with a housing plan. Uh, certainly, again, you have that locally, but that's the first place that communities need to start thinking to figure out what their needs are, what the target is, how many do you need, and how are you going to get there, and really to map that out. Uh, and then looking at the zoning and building codes. How do you, once you've identified how you're going to increase the supply, and achieving that, again, innovative, creative approach to housing, you have to make sure you can actually build it. And so that's what we're seeing. The experimentation and looking at how to revise codes are often updated more than every 15 or 20 years. And you need current codes to be able to reflect current needs. And it, it's so interesting because we put a lot of time and effort into the codes process and making sure that we are addressing needs as far as resiliency and energy efficiency, those types of things. But we also have stats that, that really show us how rent controls, for example, aren't really an answer that the government can put forward and show where it does help and work. It really adds to the cost of needed housing in the long haul. Are there any other things that you've seen that governments have uh, brought up or anything else that, that you want to cover? Well, there's things that other local governments can also do to support housing supply. That might be whether it's investing in infrastructure 
or uh, sometimes land donation, fee waivers, those are all ways to lower that cost of housing. Because one of the issues is the cost of building new construction. Uh, I've heard some conversation earlier about existing older housing versus new construction. We need both, right? Because the older housing is going to what build older housing. And older housing is what has inherent affordability that's important, but you still need to add to that supply, and that's really important as well. Right. I think the flexibility and ability to modify is important. Sometimes if you get too locked into this is how it has to get built, this is how it has to get done, that creates some risks because it makes it harder for builders to be able to really meet the market needs where they are. It's interesting. So, you know, as we look at this, where do you think it's taking us? Where, where are we headed over the next few years to address the cost of housing, housing affordability? Absolutely. Some of what we need to think about is being more innovative in the housing types that we have. If we just keep doing what we've done in the past, we get to where we are right now. And so some of the examples that I've seen coming out are things like co-living. Uh, I've seen that it's in, in various markets in the country. I was looking recently at an example in Atlanta, uh, and that's where people may have their own private living space, but other shared amenities, whether it might be shared cooking space, shared living space, as well as their own private space. And it's a way to create more opportunities for people to, to live in a compact area to lower housing costs, and that's an important innovation there. Smaller homes uh, can do that as well, and there's just important to be able to think more creatively and then to have the public policy that can help support the construction of those housing types. Yeah, multi-generational is a huge uh, area that we're seeing increased development as well. You know, being able to have all different groups living under one roof, and we when we fall short on the supply side, people fill in how it's needed, and we've come up with quite a few creative solutions to that as well. What do you see as some of the construction trends of where that's going? It seems like something that's an important consideration. You, you know, one of the things that, that we have in the forefront, so uh, the main issue for me this year as chairman has been housing affordability, and it will be with Dean Mond's chairmanship next year, housing affordability right into the election cycle. It's that critical and that important. When we're working with HUD and we hear that, you know, 25 percent of a purchase price of any home has been added due to regulatory compliance, all different areas of that. On average around the country, some areas are even much higher than that, but that's a serious concern. And one of the other stats that they use is the fact that over the last 15 years, the average age of a first-time buyer has increased by five years. So instead of being 25, 26 years old, we're up to 30, 31. It changes the whole dynamic of the American dream and the things that we strive for. The ability to be able to start your family, have rentals that work, and I think, Deborah, I think you're going to need uh, the mic here. So when we look at that over time, it's really important that we're looking at the ability for people, everybody, all surveys show that you still strive toward home ownership and that being the American dream that's at the forefront of establishing your, your existence in a community, your personal wealth, as well as the education of your family and so on. So, I mean, why don't you just wrap up with some of those thoughts? Absolutely. I think that um, what you're describing is really important. I've also seen a lot of concern about just the cost of labor um, being a consideration, so that's going to be a continued need to, yes. to work in that direction to make sure we have people going into the trades, because, again, lowering the cost of housing is about partly increasing supply, but making the cost of building that housing as efficient as it can be as well. And so those are some important elements that we really need to consider. Uh, and though, so getting to the missing middle housing, um, making local uh, governments really plugged into where they need to be with housing planning, loosening up uh, zoning codes, uh, and making it accessible to build the supply that we need. 
Good. And our Home Builders Institute and our National Endowment are helping with that workforce development piece and getting some curriculum into high schools and our ability to educate people, bring them right into our industry. We're working with veterans and a lot of others and welcoming. As we sit here today, we have 379,000 job openings in our industry. It's critical that we start addressing that need as well. Thank you. Thank you all very much for being here.